Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Ask an Expert session. Super happy to have you join us today. Please feel free to say a quick hello in the comments. Tell us where you're from. And uh, if you have any questions, drop them there. And if we get a chance, we'll be sure to ask them today. I I'd like to welcome with me today, very, very special to have Annalise, Program Manager from Agriculture Livelihoods. Annalise, how are you doing today? Hi, good afternoon. I'm good, thanks. So hello, hello everybody, and thank you for joining this uh, session. Thank you also for the questions you've asked in the, on, the, on the website. And uh, if you have some live comments, we'll try to answer these questions now or later uh, when, we, uh, when we can pu publish them online. So as I said, I'm Annalise Wethoffs. I work as a program manager at the IKEA Foundation in the Agricultural Livelihoods Portfolio. And in this portfolio, we seek to help people living of agriculture to afford a better life while also protecting the planet. We do that by, of course, looking at IKEA for inspiration, to looking at their values and how they uh, see it, but also by partnering with organizations, leading organizations across the globe that contribute to shifting the uh, global food and agricultural system from one that is currently uh, a system that is depleting resources, that takes away from nature, but does not really give back, to one that is um, regenerative and one that remains within the planetary boundaries. And we've organized this session because we believe that food is something that unites us all. And um, it is also something that can be uh, an underestimated key to a planet positive future. Uh, one that is circular, one that is regenerative, one that restores land rather than degrades it, and one that gives healthy and nutritious food for a growing world population, while also being a source for economic and social well-being for the many people. I am extremely honored to have here with me two experts on this very matter uh, who can shed more light on this. And with me are Willem Feverda, CEO of Common Land. And Hello, good afternoon. Hi, Emily's. Hi. And Sharla Halverson, the Global Health and Sustainability Hello. Manager at IKEA Food. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Hi, welcome, welcome. So, he founded, uh, he's the CEO of one of our partner organizations, I, I said, uh, Common Land. He founded it seven years ago um, to catalyze massive landscape restoration across the globe. Um, and together with his team, he has developed a quite unique approach to this the four returns approach, bringing no less than four returns on investment to landscapes and the people um, who are a part of the landscape. Sharla joined IKEA a year ago uh, almost. And she is on a mission to drive IKEA's people and planet positive future uh, strategy for all that has to do with food at IKEA. So during this session, they will be presenting a little bit more about themselves, about what they do, uh, before we dive deeper into the topic of the day. So let us start with you, Sharla. Uh, Sharla, can you tell us what is this people planet positive strategy of IKEA exactly? And could you tell us a bit more about how it is reflected in, in, in the strategy for IKEA for food? Sure. So the IKEA People and Planet Positive focuses on three strategic uh, pillars for action. Um, we look at healthy and sustainable living, circular and climate positive, and fair and equal. And within this, uh, for IKEA food, uh, we've taken this down and tried to drill it into um, exactly where can we have the impacts on the people and planet positive strategy when it comes to our activities in food services and in consumer packaged goods um, as we meet uh, customers along the value chain um, and we also source from people along the value chain. Uh, so we identified that um, the main areas that we can have an impact are of course uh, around nutrition, so looking at balanced meals and healthy choices. This has a quite a big impact on uh, healthy and sustainable living, uh, especially among our consumers. Uh, we also have identified packaging uh, as a key area of action to deliver to the people and planet positive strategy. Uh, and that really is focusing on the circularity uh, strategic area. Uh, and um, this is uh, focusing really on the impact on the natural environments as well as circularity. Uh, and then when we go into um, the climate positive uh, aspects, we've identified um, uh, also through the available science we know uh, that the main areas that impact uh, in climate are uh, around proteins. Uh, so we uh, look at uh, better uh, animal-based proteins as well as 
looking at alternative proteins that would be plant-based. Uh, and this then also has a big impact on the healthy and sustainable living pillar. Uh, in addition to that, we look at food waste. Uh, we know that this is also one of the largest contributors to climate impact globally. Uh, and there is impacts, of course, in the pre and post harvest. Uh, within food, we know that there are impacts within our restaurants. Uh, and uh, then there's also, of course, an impact by uh, our customers at home as well. Uh, and then uh, perhaps the biggest uh, kind of comprehensive area to look at is uh, responsible agricultural systems. Um, of course, proteins and food waste also have big impacts within the responsible agricultural systems. Uh, we know that this is the largest contributor to um, uh, climate within the food value chain. And it's also the area where we have the biggest impact on human rights and livelihoods. Uh, so this is what we focus on in order to deliver to the overall IKEA people and planet positive strategy. Okay, thank you. Very clear. Interesting to hear. And uh, Willem, can you tell us a bit more about Common Lands? What inspired you to start it seven years ago? And what is it that you do to get full returns on investment? Yeah, um, yeah. So I, ha I have a background in in conservation and uh, have been working in the conservation world for many years on projects on you know restoring and and uh, conserving uh, protected areas of rainforest and so on. And uh, when working in that area, I realized that that uh, long term planning is very important, and also that we need to take into consideration you know the the other needs than conservation alone. And as, and then you run immediately into into land use systems, and of course uh, agriculture is the one of the most important land use systems we have, uh, to get a bit mining and the other systems uh, we have imposed over the last yes, centuries uh, on the planet. So. Um, I, at a certain moment, I realized that that you know the 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 whole system change that we need if we if we if we want to solve the the crises that are that are now currently coming over as like uh, the, cri the the climate crisis, but also the biodiversity or the ecosystem crisis, uh, the food crisis, um, water shortages, and you know all these 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 more ecosystem related issues or nature related issues that we need to have a a, a kind of system approach where where ecology and economics are coming together. And uh, basically where that will come together is at uh, in, in, in an area, so hectares in a place. The, the current economic system basically is used on, um, on, on maximization of, of financial returns per hectare. And that always leads to, uh, to degradation. And uh, if we impose another system that is a, a, a maximization of, let's say, a well-balanced for return system where you where the return of inspiration comes back, as well as the return of um, of, of, of of social capital, have meaningful jobs and biodiversity, the return of natural capital, and you then can create sustainable financial capital systems or, or regenerative agricultural agroforestry systems, then you will create a sustained landscape that will that will deliver you know food and and products and fibers but also will produce and restore and conserve uh, biodiversity nature so that's basically when i set up common land uh, seven years ago i wanted to make sure that it is possible to to develop a system at a landscape approach and 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 bit farmers and and people working on the land and, and see how that is possible to do that well uh, at a large scale. Uh, because, you know, we are talking about probably one quarter or even a third of the land mass in this world that is severely or heavily degraded. So that is, you know, double the size of China uh, in, in, in area size. And that is, that is just big, very big. We need to really think in scale and in replicable models. Um, to do that. And Commonland is just trying to prove that this four returns zoning model that this is working. And I can tell a little bit more about it later. But that's basically what I'm trying to do. Okay. But could you could you tell a bit more about the, the four returns three zones model? What is it about? What are these four returns? And what yeah. are the zones exactly that you're uh, working with? Yeah, now, so, so let's say today, um, uh, Corporations, farmers, they all work in, in one way. They, they want to produce as much as food or fibers or, or trees or whatever per hectare. And that creates a disbalance between, let's say, the production side 
uh, because you create monocultures uh, that are only made for for production and let's say uh, the the natural the, the nature uh, you know the, we, we need to find a balance and um only if you look um, and that that has that that model has spread all over the world so what we what you need is a balance between what we say is a kind of three zone approach so each large area let's say an area the size of uh, a quarter of the netherlands or or an, an whole island that you need to look into a, a, a zoning approach so you need to understand where are the critical areas that you want to protect and that are that needs to be protected to be protected because water comes out of it uh, you have uh, a lot of biodiversity that will help you to to uh, to 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 uh, to make sure that uh, that plagues and pesticides are less needed. Pollination is important, so we call that the natural zone. So we need to identify where do we want to have the natural zone and where you can protect it. The the second thing thing is that in many areas now we have urban zones where infrastructure and let's say monoculture areas are dominating the landscape. We call that the economic zones. Those economic zones and those natural zones are linked to each other, but more, most of the people have forgotten about it. But if you live from a water catchment that comes from a forest and the forest will disappear, that happens in many countries, then at the end, you won't have any water at the end of the pipe and the city will go down the drain. So, so that is the combination. But in between, you have a zone that does not exist in many countries, in most of the countries of the world. And that is where you can produce agriculture or other activities and increase nature. So you work with nature. We call it the combined zone. That is where regenerative agriculture or regenerative agroforestry products will, will, will be harvested. And that combined zone actually is the you could say the new way of looking towards the future. We need to increase the combined zone on behalf of the monocultural economic zone, and we need to protect the natural zones. And within a landscape, these three zones form a unit. And if you can work within those three zones and identify activities, business activities or conservation activities or other activities that can help to establish these three zones during a yeah multiple years, then you are able to create um, systems that work for uh, and for other species and produce a lot of food and bringing down the risks of, of climate change and, and, and erosion and so on. Mm -hmm. So that is what we call the three zones approach. And those three zones will deliver four returns instead of only financial returns. Inspirational returns, social returns, jobs, natural returns, biodiversity, and sustainable financial returns. And that's why, that's why we have called this model, four returns are delivered by a three zones landscape approach during a minimum period of 20 years, because this will take a lot of time. Yes, thanks. Uh, that's that's clear. And I think it, it, it also shows a little bit your story, what you've been telling. Um, that has been quite far from private sector um, stories so far. <laughs> recently private sector uh, was not occupied with uh, with sustainability at all it was usually um, CSR corporate social responsibility related but more talk than action really and um, I'm, I'm really happy to see that there is a shift happening right now uh, an increasing amount of companies are taking an active stance on sustainability um, and are looking at ways to to improve their 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 business model it's, it's really becoming a strategic factor for business success um, today. Uh, even just last week, we had a, an Ask the Expert session uh, here as well on this platform with Jesper Brodin, the CEO of uh, Inca. And he said that sustainability is not charity. It is the new business model. And, and that echoes a lot from what you're saying. So I wanted to turn back to Sharla and, and Looking at what Willem was just talking uh, about, about the three zones and the four returns, and then also taking into account uh, Jesper's um, comment that uh, sustainability is the new business model, how would you translate it into uh, IKEA food when it comes to sustainability and, and especially environmental sustainability? Um, so I 100% uh, believe in um, Jesper's statement as well. To me, it's very clear that sustainability is 
the new business model. Uh, it's what we need to be striving towards uh, in all that we do. Um, and especially if we are looking at making sure that we're preserving resources uh, for current and future generations, we know that there are a, a lot of um, areas at risk at the moment. And so we need to take a very proactive action. Um, and uh, in terms of IKEA food, uh, of course, we're acting in all areas of the value chain. Uh, and uh, when we're talking about the landscapes, we're talking about responsible sourcing of our materials. Uh, for us, uh, of course, all of our ingredients, uh, all of the materials that go into our food products are critical. Um, but we've also identified some that uh, have some more critical issues that we must address uh, a bit faster. Uh, and so within these critical materials, we've taken the approach of using certifications uh, in order to ensure that we are helping to deliver to that more sustainable future. So we have certifi certifications on uh, all of our uh, uh, extremely critical products. So we have uh, certifications on tea. We use Oots Rainforest Alliance or Fair Trade. Many of our teas are also organic. Um, in coffee, uh, it's also Oots Rainforest Alliance uh, and uh, organic as well. Our chocolate bars are all Oots Rainforest Alliance uh, certified. Our jams are all organ organic, uh, also from uh, wild berries as well. Uh, our rapeseed is organic. Anything with palm oil, we use RSPO certification. Uh, and uh, then with fish, uh, we ensure that everything is ASC and MSC certified. And we've actually worked very closely with ASC and MSC uh, to uh, move forward. Uh, in sustainability in seafood. Uh, and we've also had the privilege of um, being the first to introduce ASC MSC certified seafood into many markets around the world. Uh, then we also have what we call our better programs. And this is where we're looking at all products containing eggs, meat, dairy, uh, that they would be covered under these better programs. Uh, and uh, these are designed to promote animal centered farming with a key focus on the animal welfare uh, and responsible use of antibiotics, but also uh, environmental management. So it's really taking a holistic approach to uh, the animals that we source. Uh, and uh, then um, this comes to actually another one of our critical uh, ingredients, and this is soy. So actually in soy, this is indirect for food. Uh, in most cases, we have very, very little soy in, in our actual food range. Uh, but it is uh, very common in animal feed. And so we uh, identified that actually through um, having animals in our range, we are also indirectly sourcing quite a lot of soy. And we've actually signed the Cerrado Manifesto, uh, which is designed to protect the Cerrado zone in Brazil. Uh, and we are actively involved in ensuring that soy is sourced in a way which incorporates a landscapes approach uh, so we want to make sure that it's protecting forests and uh, the landscape and native vegetation. Uh, we want to do this through collaborating across industry, civil society, governments, uh, and of course, uh, make sure that any agricultural expansion is not causing uh, future deforestation. Uh, and uh, these are just a few examples of what we do in IKEA, um, uh, in IKEA food. Uh, across IKEA, of course, there are many other initiatives uh, in forestry. They're very strong in, uh, in agroforestry uh, and collaboration across all of the different um, individuals in, uh, in civil society and industry and government. Um, and also uh, that holistic um, uh, landscapes approach is very important to the approach that they take. Uh, and I think one of the things that's really important for us is that uh, we are there for the many people. Uh, and we want to ensure that sustainably sourced food uh, is really something that everyone can access. It doesn't need to be, it shouldn't be something that is just for people who have thicker wallets. Um, and that said, um, we do have a very strong value in IKEA uh, to renew and improve. Uh, as our founder, Ingvar Kamprad, has said um, many times over, uh, glorious future, much remains to be done. Uh, and this is how we also approach the certifications. Uh, we know that even though certifications don't always cover everything, we believe it's important to engage with certification bodies and work to 
uh, work with them to improve and to move the whole industry forward. So this is why we've taken the certification approach. Super. I think many people are learning quite a lot about uh, the sustainable sourcing of IKEA. It, it is not very, very known uh, to the many people, I think, that this is so important to IKEA and becoming more and more important, as you say, but it remains to be done and you continue to, to renew and improve. Uh, Willem, how, how would you react to this? Having introduced the, the three zones, do you, uh, so the three zones, let me recap for the, for the people who are not so well versed in, in the three zones. The economic zone where all the businesses have a, the main activity where the infrastructure is, the natural zone needs to be conserved, protected, and then the combined zone uh, where the, the, the economic activities and the ecological uh, protection or natural restoration come together. Um, listening to, to Charla speak about, about the certification, about the sustainable sourcing, even taking a landscape approach to, uh, to soy sourcing, how do, you, how do you see the role of, uh, of corporations? What, what would be your reaction and how do you see the role of corporations in the different zones um, as they are now, but also going forward? If we say much remains to be done, what remains to be done, do you think? When it, yeah, um, I think... Thank you. Um, so this is a this is a wide on a, a topic, but I think corporations can play a, a huge role, and especially corporations like IKEA, who are already, as Shala said, in on on track with certification. But uh, yeah, we need to understand that a landscape approach is going beyond certification. So we yes, certification is super important as a as a first step, and we have developed that over the last let's say twenty years. But a landscape approach is about um, uh, making sure that uh, that that we create sustainable landscape for the many many decades to come and uh, we have developed that methodology for turns three zones to make sure that people understand what they're doing and, and different steps and to make sure that they understand the landscape the zoning uh, where are they uh, they get a sense of place farmers but also corporates um, for corporations i think it's super important that they can help to establish landscape approaches in the areas they uh, source from and also in the areas where they sell where they have customers so um what so, so ikea mentions or charlie mentioned the example of the serrado manifesto which is a kind of a landscape approach i think that's that is a good uh, a next step and and what we would love to see is uh, long-term partnerships with corporations to drive this process uh, governments are uh, in general still quite absent in these kind of processes they are especially uh, yeah they are in sh short termism is 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 is, is, is the main uh, dominant factor yet uh, in this here so uh, if you want to have long term processes we need long term partnership of corporates local farmers associations and conservation organizations to work together to make sure that these landscape approaches are becoming real. Uh, you start, of course, with a dream and a vision, uh, but you can identify all the activities in that area to make sure that you create sustainable business cases with regenerative products and conserve areas and connect natural systems with corrid ecological corrid corridors and create jobs. That is all possible. So one of the one of the the questions here, for instance, is uh, local uh, sourcing. Uh, that is super important. If you create combined zones, you will also create more diverse uh, agricultural systems that will, uh, you know, will uh, create healthy soils, will increase the water table, will bring biodiversity back, but also will have a, a more, varia uh, more, more diverse production. Uh, think about uh, uh, turning a monoculture of a plantation into an agroforestry system. So, so that means local sourcing is, is an important topic here as well. But my main issue here is uh, if we go beyond certification, we need to think in long-term partnership with corporate with corporates uh, who really uh, mean what they say. So we are not talking about greenwashing, but we really want to walk the path for decades to make this happen. And meanwhile, can stimulate new business cases in those areas. Well, you've been you've been working on this now with Commonland for for seven years, and you have a number of flagship landscapes in which you work. So I see there's coming in from Nick uh, online. Um, do you have an example of this three zones, four returns approach where corporates have um, a tangible, yeah, uh, uh, 
where let me phrase it correctly. Uh, yes. For uh, example, as a tangible example of the benefits of this model. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so the idea of this model was not to create a theoretic model. We just wanted to do it, and we started doing this in four large areas. In the uh, we started in South Africa, in Australia, Spain, and the Netherlands, uh, as as the as a testing you know as testing sites. Uh, we, uh, we started up local landscape for terms partnerships in Spain, uh, in Australia, in in Spain, for instance, uh, there is a huge area of a million hectares between Granada and Murcia, southern Spain. It is the most uh, degraded, isolated, abandoned place in Europe, almost, where the farmers are surviving and uh, rain, rain are going down. And we created a regenerative almond company uh, and helped to establish a partnership of farmers, land owners, and uh, and conservation organizations, including local governments and city councils, and that is now accelerating. Uh, here we are now teaming up uh, increasingly with with corporates to make sure that uh, they are the off taker of the products that will come out of that uh, that landscape. And in Australia, we were able to uh, set the scene for the first regenerative forage company that is now listed um, in West Australia, and that company is taking the lead in uh, bringing on board farmers and conservation organization and show them how you can create a, a regenerative or combined zone from an area that has been uh, deforested over the last 120 years entirely the wheat belt of australia um, and uh, be used for a, let's say a monoculture system for cereals first and now we we we, we, we produce rotational meat uh, rotational oats and that is now gradually going on and on so um, you can find more on the website, but we are we are testing this now, this model, and you know after seven years we can say yes, it is working. People understand the language, we can measure it, and we gradually can bring on board investors. But we still need uh, subsidies to uh, to make sure that the, those landscape partnerships will be the driver behind this system change. Thank you. And then the, the other question, you already touched upon it uh, briefly, uh, Willem, about local sourcing and the importance for local sourcing. Sharla, can you uh, react to that? What is IKEA's stance on, on that? Um, well, local sourcing obviously plays an important role in uh, a lot of our uh, fresh products that are sold in, uh, in our restaurants. Um, however, I would say with local sourcing, you have to take the approach of you need to source locally what makes sense to source locally. Uh, so uh, just sourcing everything locally isn't actually going to have the positive impacts that you are looking for. Uh, if you want to um, really have a, a, a holistic approach to the food you purchase, uh, then you need to understand that actually the, uh, the yields and the inputs that go into the product are different from uh, from town to town and especially from country to country. Uh, so the biggest factor that's going to drive the, the climate footprint at least of your, uh, of your food is was it grown in a, uh, and in soil that was optimized for growing it. And in some cases that is actually going to be an imported option. Uh, and in some cases that is going to be uh, something that is locally grown. Uh, and I think the landscape's approach, as there is a, a more holistic approach to these natural ecosystems and uh, the economic zones, including uh, farms, uh, that are building up their soils and improving the, um, uh, the soil health, uh, there could be more products that would make sense to source locally. Uh, and uh, I'm sourcing locally where you can really support local industry is, uh, is something to look at. Uh, but from a a global perspective, actually, it, it can sometimes make a lot of sense to source it from, from a climate that was intended to grow that product. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two other questions that I wanted to take on. I think I'm looking at the time. I think we still have some minutes. Uh, those questions were asked on forehand on the, uh, on the website. And um, the first one is, what can regular people do in their daily lives? We've been talking about businesses, corporates, but what about just us, just people? Uh, how can we make the most positive environmental impact and how can we track it? Maybe Shala, could you, could you take this one? Yeah. Uh, so I think um, from a, a food perspective, especially, the science is super clear on this. Um, with the current agricultural systems and they function 
today, the most immediate way that you as a consumer uh, can decrease your climate footprint um, and probably the simplest way for you to do it right now is, uh, is to eat more plant-based. And this will decrease your climate footprint by uh, very large percentages, uh, your land use footprint, your water use footprint, uh, water pollution footprint. Uh, so there's quite a lot of science out there that really um, shows very clearly that uh, having more plant-based materials in your diet is going to have a beneficial impact. Um, that said, animals are an important part of a landscape's approach. Uh, and as this, this becomes more widespread, the environmental impact of animal agriculture will likely improve. Um, and then also on top of that, you know, what you eat is only uh, one step. Uh, maybe the first step you can take, the simplest step you can take, and then you can go a bit further in looking into all of your consumption habits and your travel habits. Um, there's, it's going to take many, many small steps by billions of people for us to achieve what we need to achieve. Thank you. There's one other question from, uh, that was asked on forehand, and, and Willem, I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, so let me read it out so that I get the, the wording right. Quote, with governments that don't want to raise food prices, how will the huge costs associated with natural, social and human capital decline be covered? That's a, a tough question, I guess. Um, you... yeah. yeah, that's a, that's a tough one, uh, but a very good one. Um, I, I think there, here again, it is a, it's a combination. Of course, if governments don't work on this, at a certain moment, the food prices will go up uh, because they have to, they, they will lose the soil, they will lose the biodiversity, and thus they will lose productive areas. Uh, and without any innovation, um, uh, the food prices will go up because they need to import more. Um, and that will not be, you know, not, not serve anyone. So uh, clever governments uh, that don't want to raise the food prices need to uh, look into things like uh, carbon pricing. They need to look into uh, making small regional far uh, regenerative farming more uh, attractive again through tax incentives or other ways of land use sharing or whatever. Uh, they also need to understand they if they don't accept the true costs, you know, the real true cost of, of food that um, and if they don't want to share that, that uh, that that um, uh, yeah, that if they don't want to work on that, that this this will be a severe crisis for everybody. So um, leverage of cooperation at the landscape level is important. Uh, taxation is important of uh, unsustainable uh, food corporations in the in those countries, um, uh, or, or we call them degradation corporates uh, that that are increasingly degrading and degrading the system. Um, but also look into uh, you know a very cheap way to. Uh, to make sure that you will leverage the food system is by active protection of the, the last remnant of forest and, and ecological habitats that ensure uh, at the, uh, for the long run the healthy soils and uh, the productive areas. So you need to work on different levels in different zones. But of course here again also uh, political cooperation between governments is super important. You know if we as, as ecosystems are cross-borders systems um, we cannot solve this uh, alone. So you can't solve this as one, as one government or one one entity or, or one you know group of farmers. You need to think uh, basically um, on in an ecosystem. In, you need to bring ecology more in the decision making system. And um, and I'm and I'm convinced that uh, because we can produce a lot of food per hectare in regenerative methodologies and uh, still may may you still may use some chemicals and so on, but that can be slowly built down and down. Um, I'm pretty convinced that uh, that if you work on these processes together um, and share that vision with the people uh, on the land, they want to work with these kind of things. And that's, that's our experiences as well. We have find the language that farmers, as well as conservation organizations, as well as local entrepreneurs and investors are gradually understand that this is the way forward. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty positive that, that also governments that don't want to raise food prices will have sufficient other tools to, um, uh, to uh, restore the landscape. Okay, I think that's... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. And it will take time, unfortunately. Ecology will not go fast. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were you had this saying about you can throw as much money at a tree as you want; it will never grow faster. But you who said well, that? somebody yeah, else. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, so so planting. So everyone is now talking about planting trees, which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. But planting a tree is easy. But mm-hmm. getting letting a tree become mature within let's say fifty or hundred years that is the tough work. That's really mm-hmm. tough, and you. So it, you know, it won't help to throw a lot of euros or dollars uh, over a tree. It will, yeah, it will not grow faster. But to create the same, the same is true for landscapes and soil, of course. Yeah. So, um, let me see. Do we have time for one more question? I think we should have. Um, how do you foresee that this approach can be scaled? enough to realize the needed food system transformation and who should drive it governments or rather downstream corporates or even consumers i think we might have you might have answered this question more or less maybe shala do you want to uh, add to what willem has said before about how everybody needs to collaborate i think that that um, will also answer the question that sean is asking yeah i think that is extremely important um actually the collaboration aspect I think if we try and say that it's just the responsibility of one actor uh, in the system, then it can never work, actually. It really needs to be um, governments, uh, corporations, uh, and the consumers uh, working together uh, and all working towards the same outcome. Uh, So there's uh, a lot of work to be done. Okay, so let us return then to the question of the day uh, that we started this uh, session with. Can food be the hidden key to a planet positive future? What do you think? Sorry, can you repeat it? I I didn't hear it because there was something wrong with the speaker. Okay, I wanted to, to, we're almost at the time, I wanted to return to to the begin question of the session. So could food, in your opinion, be the hidden key to a planet positive future? Yes, I think uh, it is one of the hidden things. I think food connected to ecosystem-based solutions, so ecology, will be a, a very important tool for a sustainable uh, future. Uh, but it means that people need to understand that food is connected to natural systems. And it's not something that you just put on the table because it's it's coming from the supermarket. And if we can are enabling that educational awareness, then uh, I'm I'm optimistic. Shana? Yeah, I, uh, I think uh, certainly food uh, as part of a sustainable food system is a key, uh, but we have to remember that the door has many, many locks. Um, I think perhaps a landscapes approach, including agricultural systems, could be the crowbar or maybe even the Allen key uh, that could open this door for, for all of us. <laughs> that was that is on these nice words. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, on these nice words, I want to thank you both for a for a very very inspiring conversation. Uh, you've given us a lot of food for thought uh, here. Uh, to me, it's it's really been inspiring, and it is inspiring to work with uh, with you, Willem, uh, and Commonland, and so many of the other partners that are making these lovely, beautiful, optimistic and ambitious contributions to change the food and ag system for a, for a more world for the many people. And it prides me also to be part of the IKEA family and to see that um, within IKEA, the steps I taken are being taken as well uh, and that you are uh, leading the way uh, for many to follow. So I really uh, appreciate uh, hearing all the comments online, seeing all the people that have joined us from from Qatar to Spain to the Netherlands to, I'm not sure where, I'm missing a lot of countries, I think, but Indonesia, people are joining in India even, even it's, it's there. Yeah. So thank you all from across the globe to listening to this conversation. And I hope you also have been inspired um, to embrace collaboration um, and that with that collaboration and daring to take a long-term view without shying away from taking action right now, we are going to get there. So thank you so much, both Shaila, Willem, and everybody online. Over to you, Ryan. 
Thank you so much. Thanks to all three of you. You did a fantastic job. Super interesting session. We got some great comments throughout. So thanks to all the people who are watching along and commenting live. I hope we were able to answer a few of those questions. Charlotte, I love you. Just happened to have an Allen key there. So very yeah. IKEA of you. <laughs> uh, but I mean, you know, I, I, I love hearing about the collaboration that's required. Um, and, you know, it's interesting having Commonland and IKEA here, two organizations that are really focused on long term planning. Uh, and the benefits that we can really take away from doing this long-term planning. So super inspiring for me. Um, for all of you watching, next week we are back with another Ask an Expert. We have Barry Shorey from the International Rescue Committee. This is kicking off our, uh, our month of refugee kind of uh, topic. We're really excited. Hope we can have, come back for that. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Someone's asking if this is available for others who are not present. You can absolutely watch this later. We will have it available for you to watch online through all of our social media networks. With that, I think let's all say a nice big goodbye. Thank you so much for watching, and uh, we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>